So, I've really been looking forward to preaching this message this morning. I've entitled it, What is Kryptonite to Our Prayer? Ben asked, uh, or we made a decision as a team, that we would speak about the power of prayer this morning. And as I was preparing it, I sort of landed in this place of thinking about what are the things that weaken our prayer. And um, on our first Sunday, last Sunday, it was very fitting that we began this year with testimonies to God's goodness. There were some amazing and powerful testimonies last Sunday. There was uh, testimonies to healing. There were testimonies to financial provision, provision of homes, inner healing, guidance from the Lord, answered prayers, favor, sparking of new ministries into prisons and in uh, worship music. And in fact, we had to cut it short. I think there probably would have been hundreds of testimonies in the building uh, and, and probably most people feel a little bit shy to come forward and, and say, I, I have a testimony. But the final testimony uh, from Robin was that uh, it was about the power of prayer. And he testified how prayer had carried him through some very dark times. And so today we're going to look at the power of prayer from a slightly different angle. So I'm not going to be looking at prayer from the, the perspective of look at the powerful things that prayer does. I'm going to be rather be looking at it from the angle of what makes our prayer powerful or not. And um, I do love talking about what the, the power of prayer produces. So I'm going to tell you four quick stories uh, about the power of prayer in our own lives. And in fact, um, I was looking at a Randy Clark um, video of, of uh, them praying for healing in Brazil last night. And I mean, it's just, it, do yourself a favor, just Google healings Randy Clark. It's unbelievable. Uh, they had this guy who had a motorcycle accident in front of the church and he had eight screws and two metal rods down his neck at the top of his spine, and uh, they were, he, he's just seen a lot of the stuff of people who have metal plates, metal rods in their body of it just disappearing. And so this guy comes up, you can see the scar, the marks where all the screws have been, and he's just moving his neck like this completely. He said, I could not move my neck at all before. There were two rods in my neck, and I had to turn like this, and so on, it just completely healed. There was a lady who had lost an eye, and, uh, and she was, had a glass eye in her socket to uh, look like a normal eye. And, and God created another eye in that socket. She had to take the glass bit out because there was an eye growing in her socket. And, uh, and I mean, there were just, it's just one thing after another, after another. And that same Jesus is in the house here this morning by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we are just some of our little stories. When we had come to the UK, we were here for two years, and um, the, um, we just longed to go back to South Africa to see family and so on. And we just had absolutely no money. We, came, we had come across here, used up all our finance. We'd come to plant a church. And uh, we sat down and, and we said, you know, God's taught us to be specific in our praying. And so we actually worked out a budget. How much would it cost us to go back to South Africa with three children? And we worked out this budget, and we came to a specific amount. And uh, we said, Lord, this is what we need. And uh, not long afterwards, I can't remember the time frame now, but it was not long afterwards, uh, some people from um, Qatar phoned us and said, we've been praying for you. And we would like to give you a gift. This is not for the church. This is for you personally as a family. And it was exactly that amount that they gave us. And so we had an awesome time going back to South Africa. Another time we were, we were praying, we, we needed a car. 
And so we said, what kind of car would we like? We don't, we, you know, we're not wanting to say, God, we, we, we want a Bentley or something. We say, God, we would like a white Japanese. Now, this is South Africa. Lots of people buy white cars, not the UK. So we want a white Japanese model 1300 sedan with four doors. And uh, some friends contacted us and says, said, we've got a white Honda 1300 that we feel God's told us to give to you. And, uh, and so that was another little example. Um, another one was uh, just a sort of uh, a funny little one, was we were visiting Nola's dad and um, our, with our dog, a little um, beetle, and she ran away. She disappeared. And we, we walked around the area around Nola's dad's house, calling, 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 she was gone. And then we said, let's just pray. And we prayed, and God gave me a picture of a park that was probably um, nearly a mile away from where we were. And we had to drive there sort of a roundabout way. And God said to me, go, and the picture I had in my mind, not, not God said to me, but the picture I had in my mind was go to this place, drive to the top of this park, get out the car and call for your dog. And so we drove around there, got out the car, called for the dog, and she came running up the bank to me from, from the park. I mean, that same Jesus is in the house today. He's here by his Holy Spirit. I love the testimony uh, I told you I'd tell you four stories, so uh, I've got to contain myself a bit here. But um, also our home in Derby, I told the, the testimony, I, f- I forget where it was a prayer thing or something, where we had looked at 18 homes. We always feel like God gives us a home. There's like a sense of down payment in our hearts. Yes, this is where God wants us to live. And it, it was, uh, and we had looked at all these homes and we had said, God, we'll live in, you know, there many of them we could have lived in, but we just didn't feel that down payment in our hearts. And, um, and so, Nora and I were talking about the homes that God's given us in the UK, and we said, do you know that every one of those homes has been in a cul-de-sac? Isn't that a remarkable thing? Um, is that maybe God's thumbprint on Him blessing us with a home? And so, we were praying for this home, and, and the 19th home, Nola said, you know, I've seen a place... I just didn't think it was suitable, but I'd, I'd like you to go with me. And so we drive up this cul-de-sac to these big white gates, and it's a panhandle off the cul-de-sac, off the top of the cul-de-sac. It's almost like God's saying, I'm going to push my thumbprint in even a bit extra on this one. It's a cul-de-sac off a cul-de-sac, and that was our home. It's just we have absolutely loved living there. It's been God's blessing. God is wonderful. I just love the testimony of uh, the, the one guy that um, spoke on the Randy Clark video where he was saying his hearing had been restored. He, he had hearing aids and he could hear a little bit with the hearing aids, but his healing, hearing was completely restored. And they said to him, how are you feeling? And he said, I don't actually know. He said, when I felt something come on me, he said, I, feel, I felt like I went away to another place. And God was healing my hearing. And he said, in fact, right now I still feel like I'm coming back from that place. And it just, it's just like a beautiful thing of Jesus saying, come to me for a bit, son. I'm going to heal your hearing. That same Jesus is in the house today. And so I've probably taken too long on that. Um, I brought my, my own homemade kryptonite with me here today. Uh, if you don't know what kryptonite is, it, it's, a, it's a fictional material that comes from a fictional planet called Krypton, where a fictional person called Superman comes from. And the unique radiation of this Krypton uh, renders Superman very weak and powerless. And I believe there's things in our prayer, in our lives, that render our prayer weak and powerless. There's unique radiation from certain things in our lives as believers that renders our prayer weak and powerless. Just on the thing of of praying, William Temple said, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't, they don't. When when, When Jesus' disciples saw something different in him, they watched his life, they lived with him constantly, and they pinned it down to his prayer life. So they said to him, 
could you teach us how to pray? D.L. Moody said, I'd rather be able to pray than to be a great preacher. And he was, he was you know, amongst preachers, he's known as one of the prince of preachers. But he said, I would rather learn to pray than be a great preacher because Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach, but he did teach them how to pray. And so we're going to look at, uh, I've got this other McAfters in my pocket. So we're going to have a look at, at how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. So this is the Lord's Prayer. I don't want us to focus too much on the content of the Lord's Prayer. Can you focus on the mood of the Lord's Prayer? How does Jesus pray? Is it begging? Is it pleading? Is it uh, weak? Is it strong? Is it confident? Uh, Just read it with me. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you notice how bold and positive and confident that prayer is? There's no pleading. There's no begging. There's no, oh, please, God. It's very sort of, it's very positive. And uh, his prayer template covers all sorts of things. Confidence in who God is. Um, worship and reverence for him. The kingdom, the goodness and the desirability of the kingdom. His provision for us. His will being done. Uh, forgiveness, leading us, delivering us, his power and his glory. And uh, it's an incredible prayer template. It's actually a great way, if you're struggling for how to pray, just use each of the lines of the Lord's Prayer. Just You can start off with our Father and begin talking about his fatherhood and so on. It's a wonderful template for prayer. Uh, not surprising in, in that this is how he taught that we should pray. Why don't you just look at the prayer for a moment and just reflect on how bold and positive and confident this prayer is. This is how Jesus wanted his disciples to pray. And this is how Jesus wants any disciple to pray. That's you and me. This is how he wants us to pray, boldly and confidently. You'll struggle to find God's endorsement on negativity, self-pity, or a victim mentality anywhere in the Scriptures. There's plenty of it in the Scriptures, but you'll never find God's endorsement of it in the Scriptures. And I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to be honest about our struggles and about the things that we're going through. There is endorsement of that in Scripture. There's the the laments and there's the crying out to God. But He always wants us to find our place to a place of being positive and full of faith and trusting in Him at the end of the day, even in our pain. This is not a message about the power of positive thinking. It's about wrestling through in our lives. And I feel like my whole life walking with Jesus has been a wrestling through over and over again to land myself back in a place of utter trust in who God is and who he says I am. And and you and I know how many times we fail at that, how many times we believe a lie about ourselves or about reality, and we don't believe in the utter trustworthiness of God. And I think Jesus had to wrestle through that battle himself. In, the, in, the, in Hebrews chapter 5, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on this earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. The son, though he was, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. 
I think Jesus wrestled through these, the, the thing that you and I wrestle through. I'm not talking about some sort of hyper-positivity here. I'm talking about the reality of, at the end of the day. We say, God, though, though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. We get to that place where we, you know, somebody was speaking to us uh, yesterday. We, our, our niece died of COVID this last year. And somebody was saying to us, well, you know, I, 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 I struggle with praying because, you know, I prayed for her and she died anyway. But it's actually God wants us to come to the place where we say, Lord, even though she died, yet we trust in you. Yet you are good. Yet we know that you are faithful. Yet we will pray believing you with all that there is within us because we've come to this place of utterly, utterly trusting in your goodness. There have been so many Bible characters that have died. God didn't step in and save them even though they were his favored servants. There is a mystery to the kingdom. And God wants us to keep landing back in the place of absolute trust in our God, in his goodness and his faithfulness. And we're let in by the, the Gospels on the highlight moments of Jesus coming to the, the crowning moments of that trust in God in the Garden of Gethsemane with his sweat dripping off him. And, and apparently uh, it, it's known in Native American Indians that go through uh, initiation rites that are so painful that their sweat bursts blood capillaries and it comes out like blood. And Jesus is in such a moment of intense stress about what he's going to go through and yet he can say, not my will but yours be done, O God. That there is this it, coming to this place with, with everything that is within us, that even though everything seems like it's going wrong and everything seems like it's not how we would want it to be, we say, but God, I trust in you. Utterly, to the very bottom of my soul, I trust in you. I will not moan. I will not complain. I will not be in self-pity. I will not take on a victim mentality. I will trust in you. And I will pray boldly and confidently and positively because I trust in you. And my sense, I mean, we, we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see it on the cross where in that final moment of Jesus saying, I have put my life on the line. This is, a, this is a life and death matter. This is not, oh God, will you give me a home to live in? This is God. Can I trust you to the point of me dying as a criminal with these things nailed through my, my wrists and my, my ankle bones? Will I then trust you as my lungs are bursting and my heart is failing me? Will I trust you? And Jesus says, Father, to you, I commit my spirit. Trust even to the point of death. And he invites us into that, saying, this is the secret of where your prayers are powerful, is where you trust in me like this. Another thing that we notice about, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit behind on my slides is his tremendous reverence and submission and honoring of God. We, we see him saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It just oozes absolute trust and reverent submission and adoration of Father. Never coming to that place saying, Oh, God never does that for me. God never comes through for me. I've prayed and that doesn't work. Jesus just doesn't go there. And he wants to woo you and me to never go there. Because there's a, there, there is a land of freedom that you and I can come into when we utterly trust God. No matter what's going on in our lives. There, there's a place of wholeness. There's a place of being set free from the things that bind us when we trust him in that way. You can feel Jesus' absolute trust and submission in his Father. Now we've seen the mood of the Lord's Prayer. It's positive, it's bold, it's confident. And we've noticed Jesus' absolute trust in his Father that manifests in this submission and reverence and uh, honoring of his Father, which is what that passage in Hebrews said, that he, he was perfected through that reverent submission even during suffering. 
And that leads us in this study of what makes prayer powerful or not to one of the most challenging passages in the Bible, I find, and many have. I think it was Andrew Murray, the, the um, Scottish missionary who came to South Africa to proclaim the gospel and wrote so many books on prayer. And I'm paraphrasing him because I couldn't find the reference, but he said something like this, that this promise that we're about to look at is so huge and so magnificent that believers have ever since been trying to reduce it to something that is safe and manageable. There are many Bible teachers and theologians who've been so overwhelmed by this passage that they conclude that Jesus' words simply can't be taken at face value. But I want to tell you they can. And so let's turn to this amazing passage. Have faith in God, which is everything that I've been saying up to now. Have faith in God. That's a big opening to this passage. Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Now there are either one of two things that are true. Either the power of prayer is being ridiculously overrated by Jesus here. Or there is something that weakens my prayers and your prayers. Because Jesus is calling us to a power of prayer that he could see and he could experience, but that we struggle to even live with the concept of. I've come to realize that in my own life, there are things that are kryptonite to my prayers. And just as the fictional kryptonite, its unique frequency made Superman powerless and weak, so these things in my life, and I think possibly in your life too, render our prayers powerless and weak. And... Um, Jesus gives us some wonderful clues in this passage about what those things are, the, the main headings of them. The first one opens this, this passage and the other closes this passage. First one is having faith in God and the other one is forgiving. How can, you know, Jesus was so big on forgiving. If you can't forgive, I can't forgive you. And so, have faith in God being convinced of his goodness, his trustworthiness, and I think is fundamental in the power of prayer. Fundamental, as is forgiving. So have faith in God, uh, Jesus says. If we're not convinced in his goodness and his utter trustworthiness, for me, for you, if you are not utterly convinced of this, your prayers will be weakened by unbelief. Unbelief is kryptonite to our prayers. It's been said that the root of almost all brokenness and sin is believing a lie about God. Believing something that's not God's thoughts about you. It's not God's thoughts about reality. But it's our brokenness and our our growing up and our learned behaviors and our defense mechanisms and our coping mechanisms that convince us to go down a well-worn path instead of God's truth. Could I ask you for a second, could you just fold your arms, please? Everybody, could you just fold your arms quickly? Okay, now can I ask you quickly to fold them another way? Now, it's, it's a bit difficult, isn't it? The first time, you just do it spontaneously. The second time, you sort of think. 
<laughs> How do these arms work? Uh, and that's because there's a well-worn neural pathway in you for folding your arms. You've done it so many times that there's a neural pathway that you just, I always fold my right arm over my left. I just always do it that way. It's the same way with us in our behaviors and responses to things. There are well-worn neural pathways from our brokenness, our hurts, our coping mechanisms, our defense mechanisms that are not God's thoughts and God's ways in our lives. And just as it's a little awkward and a little difficult, this is just a very simple thing. This is the simplest of things. How complex is it when it comes to our psyche and our emotions and our spirit and our being Then, when we try to create new neural pathways that are different to the old ways where we've just slumped into self-pity and victim mentality and negativity and complaining. These are well-worn grooves in the record. And God's saying, I want you to renew your mind. I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will create new neural pathways that will make you you think differently and will actually make your prayers and your lifestyle and your mental health far better. But I tell you, just as difficult as it is to retrain yourself on some things, so difficult is it, and even more so, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It takes discipline. It takes concerted effort. It takes investing in things the scriptures, getting that truth into your mind. And a very close emotion to unbelief is self-pity and having a victim mentality, and that's ingrained in us and habitual. So how do we get rid of the kryptonite of unbelief and self-pity and uh, complaining and so on? Firstly, we make a decision about the Word of God. So let me ask you this question. Do you honestly, truly, and deeply in your knower, which is down here, does your knower tell you that the reality that you read about yourself and about reality in the Bible more real to you than what you feel and think about life out of your experience. Is it more real to you or isn't it? Now, I str- I, 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 let me tell you, I struggle with that. But what Scripture tells us about us is more real than the reality we live in. We live in a fallen planet. We live with broken people. We're broken. And if we want to live life according to our experience and our thoughts and our opinions, I'll tell you what, it's going to be a life that is kind of, we're going to come to prayer with kryptonite between our hands. So I'm, I'm not really sure I believe this stuff, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It's not going to be very powerful. The second thing we have to do is to be, is be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that happens through studying and internalizing and memorizing and living the Word of God. I read through the Bible last year. This year, I've decided I'm going to be doing regular studies in the Bible on things that I feel God's highlighting to me or things that I'm actually working and struggling and wrestling with. So I did one on forgiveness the other day because I found my, my mind drifting to to memorize, mem- remembering and nursing and rehearsing hurts that I've, I've perceived to me. And uh, I need to bring this into land. And the, the, the other thing that, that Jesus said about, you know, he began with have faith in God, and that really happens sort of landing here. We make decision about the word, we internalize it and we memorize it and we study it. The other thing that that passage ended with is the idea of forgiveness. And you and I have to be so careful about how we think. You've got to watch what goes on in your bonds because it's what makes our, it's what puts kryptonite between our hands when we pray, is what's going on in here. And I found my mind drifting to nursing and rehearsing hurts. And so I studied in the scriptures on forgiveness. I just put into the concordance, forgive, 
forgive with the star, and it brings up everything about forgiveness. And I tell you what, it was really challenging to me. As I sat there going through God's Word, I began to realize, hey, there's people I've got to go and speak to. There's people I absolutely need to forgive from the bottom of my heart, which I haven't. In fact, there was a guy who did discipling with Nola and I. His name was Jim Boswell, and he, used to, he said this to us. If you've truly forgiven somebody, you will never bring that thing up again to God. You will never bring it up again to yourself. You will never bring it up again to the other person, and you'll never bring it up again to anybody else. How many of us have failed on that? My hand is lifted very high. But that is what forgiveness is. Jesus says, unless you forgive from your heart, utterly forgive, then I cannot forgive you. And then what's that going to do to our praise? So, to bring this into land, maybe I've gone way too long, but maybe if I could just say this, and, I, and then I'm probably going to just run out the building. <laughs> the English are not a very direct people. <laughs> I start running. <laughs> they often tend to hint or use sarcasm or um, dry humor, or sometimes even speak to other people behind your back in the hope that you will get the point. I remember when I came from South Africa, I had these awesome surf shirts that were so colorful, and I wore them to work, you know, and one of the guys said to me, nice shirt, mate. I thought he really meant it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it took me a little while to realize what he was saying is that shirt is awful. <laughs> but there's, there's a passage in Scripture that tells us that if a fellow believer hurts you, you go and tell him and work it out just between the two of you. And if he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along with you with the, in the presence of witnesses and that will keep the thing honest and you try again. And if he still won't listen, you tell the church. And if he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch, convince, convince them of the need for repentance and offer again God's forgiving love. I think it's probably one of the least practiced things in the church, Matthew 18. I tell you what, we would have so much less stress and hurt and bitterness and unforgiveness in the church if we just lived that out. When somebody offends you, you just go to them between the two of you. I've failed at this so many times, but I believe that more times than I've failed, I've actually got it right. And, um, and I tell you what, it leaves me not living with the heartburn of unforgiveness and pain. Uh, somebody said to not actually do this is like drinking the bottle of poison and hoping the other person will die. That's what unforgiveness does for you. So, on my little kryptonite here, there's some really ugly things written on it. And uh, these ugly things say a tentative, tentativeness, a lack of confidence in God, unbelief as I'm praying, negativity, self-pity, victim mentality, thoughts that are not God thoughts about me or reality, little of God's word in me, and the big one around the top, unforgiveness. These are kryptonite to my prayers, which are meant to be very powerful. And I really would encourage you that if there's some way in which you need to respond about your trust in God, your attitude to Him, maybe things have happened to you that have left you saying, oh, He never does anything for me, or I don't trust Him, and somehow you need to renew your mind to say, I'm meant to trust God no matter what, no matter what, and I will. If there's maybe things that you've not forgiven, there's maybe things you're still nursing and rehearsing like I was, then maybe this is the day that God says, I want to change that. 
So I'm going to let Adam and Karina close off and determine our response. I'm sorry I've gone over time. But God, I pray that this word goes forth and does the work that you intended to do. Amen.